Why is one is the only one that you use the mushroom? And secondly, is there any written documentation of mushroom? Uh, the, the documentation, uh, well, there wouldn't be anything written, of course, it's earlier than that, but the documentation, it is well known that the Sahara was wetter in the past, even as recently as Roman times, Pliny called it the breadbasket of Rome, and we know that human populations were out there. We, in the Teselli, plateau of southern Algeria, there are rock paintings, Ruprestris paintings, that show shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies and, and in their hands. So we have mushroom use, we have evidence of mushroom use at the era of the great horned Paleolithic goddess. Um, the the presence or absence of monogamy and polygamy is debatable. So I, however, the, the archeology span of this area has not been well studied and won't be soon. Thanks to Islamic fundamentalism, Algeria is no place to do archeology span right now. Now to the first part of your question, why was it human beings who ate the mushrooms? Uh, well, we, you had to, to use the mushrooms as a doorway to higher intelligence, you would have had to already come a certain distance down the path of higher animal organization. We were bipedal. We had a pack signaling repertoire. We had binocular vision. And the reason we used the mushrooms was because we were under nutritional pressure. Uh, there may have been other animals under nutritional pressure, but they may have been more tightly uh, bound to their original diet, or they may simply have had behavioral organization that the mushroom couldn't dissolve or break through. There has been talk among evolutionary biologists about if there were no primates on this planet, what order of animals might occupy the conscious niche or be able to come in there. And interestingly, raccoons are candidates. Raccoons have, have well-positioned eyes. They have a very complex hand. And uh, years and years ago, I used to grow mushrooms. In, and I grew them by my own method, naturally, in jars. And uh, I would have waste rye infected with jars, and uh, I mean jars infected with mycelium-permeated rye, and I would put it out on the back porch at night, or I did once. And I awoke in the middle of the night to this terrific racket, and there were raccoons on the back porch. They could smell the rye infested with the psilocybin, containing mycelium, they could unscrew the lids and plunge their myths into this stuff. And, and as I turned on the lights, I saw these little bandit faces with this mycelial crumbs on their little upturned muzzles, and they didn't, uh, they, don't, they wouldn't back off. <laughs> they would... And the other thing was they were standing up on their hind legs. So they were standing on their hind legs, holding a jar, holding the stuff, and tottering toward me. So um, I just took one look and backed off. And for the rest of the evening, you could tell that they were approaching uh, the orgiastic boundary uh, because the carrying on, the sexual squeaking and squealing and thumping and pounding going on in the back yard was just incredible. So, uh, you know, they, they might be interesting test animals uh, to put through this, yeah. Um, John Away made his passport to Mexico 
going uh, largely on the uh, very big Baltic countries, which you obviously are familiar with. I want to uh, have your comments on the numinous nature of the UFO phenomenon with regard to the Baltic Bay, if it could be very big, and the role of this phenomenon, which I think you referred to as the other earlier in your talk, has the transformation that you're describing as going through at some time in the future. Yes, yes. Jacques Vallée was a UFO researcher in the book that was mentioned, Passport to Magonia, was his, one of his earliest books on the subject. He's gone through a lot of changes about it. Um, I think what's going on is that, uh, in a sense, there is leakage from the future. This is a broad subject, and it's late in the evening, so I'll give it to you in headlines. But basically, science takes the position that nature is without purpose. In other words, nature has no goal. Nature proceeds forward according to the unfolding of chance and necessity. But I don't believe this. I think nature is an engine for the conservation of novelty, and that the pr nature's purpose is to generate ever greater novelty, uh, and that in fact history is the dawning realization that we are about to descend down a very steep novelty sink, as it were, into immense amounts of novelty. And this is why we image the other in the 20th century as the extraterrestrial, because out of the unconscious comes this, this image of the other as the extraterrestrial. Uh, I think we are in the presence of what I call the transcendental object at the end of time, and that religions call it the Messiah or the Maitreya, secularists call it utopia, millenarians call it something else, mushroom enthusiasts something else, but that we are in the presence of the transcendental object at the end of time, and that it casts an enormous reflection back through history, especially recent history. But any person encountering this backward-moving shadow of the transcendental object will attempt to interpret it in cultural terms that they can relate to. So if they happen to be a French peasant in the 11th century, they will assume that it's the Virgin Mary. If they're a sexual, scientific rationalist in the 20th century, they will assume it's a spacecraft of some sort. Uh, the Celts and their relationship to little people and an invisible world, uh, this is a generally held belief that they are exemplifying that is worldwide, which is that the dead are somehow co-present in the space of the living, but invisibly so, except to those who have the gift of second sight or are magically empowered or shamanically <coughs> adept. Um, the last thought, I should leave you with this, and it's an adumbration of this question, but it also has deeper implications. The model that you're usually given of the psychedelic experience is a religious model, that the mysteries of religion, Hindu, Buddhist, or something rather, are somehow illuminated by this boundary-dissolving experience. My model is, is a little different, a little cooler, and I think a little more formal. And it's this, that consciousness is an omnidirectional threat detection response. That's how it evolved. That's what it's for. Consciousness coordinates all incoming perception and warns of danger. But under the influence of psychedelics, Consciousness, as it were, melts and recasts itself in a higher geometry. 
and I mean this literally, and what I want to offer to you is the idea that psychedelics are essentially a mathematical experience, not a spiritual experience, but a mathematical experience, that what unstoned ordinary consciousness is, is three-dimensional Newtonian space. And what we are released into by the psychedelics is a kind of higher space. The model for this is the shaman. Well, what does a shaman do? A shaman predicts weather, can tell where the game has gone, uh, uh, can settle minor social disputes, who stole the chicken, who's sleeping with who, and, most importantly, a shaman is incredibly adept at curing, or, to put it in slightly cynical terms, Shamans are incredibly adept at choosing clients who get well. <laughs> well, all of these abilities become transparently explainable if we assume that the consciousness of the shaman doesn't stop at the moment we call now. The shaman is somehow not a particle, but a wave with one foot in the past and one foot in the future and a coordinating intelligent intelligence in the present. So I believe that consciousness is a, is a response of mind to dimensional constraint and that when we release dimensional constraint, it's like taking a spring out of a box and the spring can then unfold to its true unstressed dimension. This is why I think what you encounter in psychedelics is nothing less than your soul made free and made naked by the fact that it is no longer confined within the, the very narrow parameters that we allow for it during uh, ordinary life and ordinary consciousness. So by that metaphor, the exploration of these states, the call to shamanism, is nothing less than the call of our own soul to return to the authentically um, numinous dimensions of experience that civilization has robbed us of. Thank you very, very much for turning out tonight. <laughs>